Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Shakela Alvarenga, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. I know that for some of you, it is your first time here, so welcome to the museum. And again, thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation, a night at the Moulin Rouge, celebrating the iconic Las Vegas resort through memories and music. Tonight will be an epic adventure as we take a trip down memory lane to relive the shining moments of Las Vegas's legendary Moulin Rouge Hotel. From the rhythmic dance moves that will leave you with joy to the captivating stories that will transport you back in time, this night promises to be unforgettable and full of excitement and wonder. A special thank you to the incredible team at the Harrison House. They poured their hearts and souls into this program, helping us to shape it into a multifaceted program featuring storytelling, music, and dance. And our sponsors, the Stephen Lackey Philanthropic Trust, we are grateful to work beside you and make these programs possible for our community. We will begin the night with a panel discussion followed by a tribute show, reminiscence of a night at the Moulin Rouge. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And first, we're going to play a quick video clip of the history of the Moulin Rouge. I always refer to it as a she. And I just envision a distressed woman in a red dress. I became kind of just like entranced. The story of the Moulin Rouge is the story of me, the story of my people. It was the first integrated hotel and casino. From the time it was built, it was built for right and it was built for good. But this is the original property. So what you see that's left is the hotel. So right about here would have been the theater. Right in here would have been like the lobby and the casino. And then right in the middle over there where it's kind of sunken in, that would have been a pool. When I think about the Moulin Rouge opening, I envision her sign lit, lit up, illuminated. I envision people super duper excited to be there. I envision black people feeling beyond proud for this moment. The Moulin Rouge closed in six months. was closed, the sheriff padlocked the doors. No one knows why he did it or where he got his orders from. It feels like the historic West Side has had the life sucked out of it. Of course, I look at what would have happened if the property had never closed in the first place. What would the neighborhood look like? I have been working on the Moulin Rouge project most of my adult life. I really feel in my heart the restoration of this property will be the beginning of the restoration of race relations in America. It's just that huge and it's just that serious. As a community group, we have formed an organization whose sole purpose is to revitalize this community, which includes the Moulin Rouge. We've had the Riviera, the Desert Inn, the Flamingo, the Tropicana. We can only guess that this neighborhood would have flourished the same as the others had the property not closed. So we believe that there was an economic injustice as well as a racial injustice that happened to a people. And not just a little part of town, but the whole people suffered behind that. 
It's important to bring back the Moulin Rouge because it would be the economic engine for this neighborhood. And I feel like it's one of those wrongs that have to be done right. Support to rebuild the Moulin Rouge in historic West Las Vegas. For decades, the property at the corner of Bonanza and MLK has been plagued with problems. Bankruptcy, fires, demolition. And now, 61 years after it first opened, community leaders are vowing to return the Moulin Rouge to its former glory. I believe every developer has failed because their development concept did not include historic preservation. Every developer who came wanted to tear it completely down and build something new. And they didn't realize how much passion and spirit is in that property. I get so overwhelmed with the Moulin Rouge. And when I see other people, her story is so much longer than mine and she's been part of it that I don't know what it's going to take. We are at the Harrison House, the historic boarding house that was developed by Miss Genevieve Harrison and it's listed in the Green Book in 1949. That's the Negro Motorist Traveler's Guide. Harrison House is important not only to the west side of Las Vegas, but to um, Las Vegas in general, because it's a safe space where we can come and discuss the racial climate here in Las Vegas and in the United States. So it's important that we are able to face racism head on and talk about it in a safe environment. When I first learned about the Harrison House, I was serving on the City of Las Vegas Arts Commission. And um, it was brought to us by a group that were working on a Pioneer Trail project. And the Pioneer Trail was, um, or is a trail that talks about Las Vegas' earliest gathering places. And the Harrison House is on the trail as a gathering place for, for famous entertainers who would come and and live in Las Vegas, they were performing in Las Vegas, but it was a time when it was during segregation and they weren't allowed to actually sleep in Las Vegas hotel rooms. So they had to have a place to live in Las Vegas. And so this was one of the upscale boarding houses or guest homes that, uh, that they would live in. So people like Sammy Davis Jr., Nat King Cole, Pearl Bailey, uh, Eddie Rochester Anderson are some of the people that we understood lived here uh, while Miss uh, Geneva Harrison own the property. Mrs. Harrison was a businesswoman and I understand she was uh, very good at it. Uh, she not only had the Harrison house, which is, um, it had three separate um, cottages out back. The house next door was an overflow. So she was just took advantage of an opportunity. She was a businesswoman, but she didn't actually run the estate. Her sister-in-law, Agatha Wilson, actually was the one who took care of the day-to-day -day operation here and Miss Geneva Harrison was just a very affluent businesswoman. This is one of the places where he stayed and the way we've learned through history that he stayed here so often that people thought it was his actual home. And uh, so we have named the main guest room here in his honor. We have the Sammy Suite here at the Harrison House. It's important for us to understand history so that we don't make the same mistakes and repeat it. But it's also important not to get caught up in history so that we can start to enjoy the present and pave a way for a, a better future. Now, without further ado, please welcome to the stage the first black showgirl on the Las Vegas Strip, Miss Anna Bailey. Mr. Sammy Davis Jr.'s son, Manny Davis. And the executive director of the Harrison House, Miss Catherine Duncan.
What a panel. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. So, Ms. Duncan, let us start with you. The Moulin Rouge, as we heard, was the first um, racially integrated resort in Las Vegas. And by all means, it was a national sensation as well. It opened in 1955. Ms. Duncan, can you briefly detail its short-lived but exciting time in Las Vegas? So some of the people here, and thank you, huh? weren't born during this time. So <laughs> let me set the stage. Nevada sent soldiers to end the Civil War. The Moulin Rouge opened 90 years after the Civil War ended. So the country of France was looking for ways to mend race relations in America. So there was a Moulin Rouge in Paris already that had opened in uh, 1889. And it had great black entertainment there. So France believed that black entertainment in Las Vegas would help bridge that divide. Mm -hmm. And um, they thought it would bring the races together. There was a, an attempt to put the Moulin Rouge on Jackson Avenue, but a lawsuit happened and it ended up on Bonanza Road. Now there were, the owners were people like Bisno and Rubin. You've heard of the Rubin sandwich. Mm -hmm. They teamed up with the heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis, and they opened this fabulous resort on Bonanza Road. After about four and a half, five months, the sheriff padlocked the doors to standing room only crowds. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, showroom opened that December. Dick Taylor, who was working at the Hacienda Hotel, opened it up that New Year's Eve. It went into bankruptcy shortly after that, and a man by the name of Leo Fry, who couldn't get a gaming license um, because he was an alleged diamond smuggler, and uh, <laughs> it eventually went to his son, and he gave leases to uh, various uh, operators. He gave a contract for sale to many of the operators, many of them being Dr. Sarah Ann Knight Preddy and the Walker family. They opened it and ran it for about 15 to 20 years as a banquet hall and a nightclub with limited gaming. There it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, so then it brought in interesting investors like Bob Johnson from BET and the, uh, the Pequot tribes. Leo Fry finally sold it to Bart Maybe, a Canadian developer, but on the day it was supposed to close escrow, it suffered an arson fire, May 29, 2003. So eventually it was taken down by the government as an unsafe building. So that's the history in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. Why do you think that the Moulin Rouge is so significant to Las Vegas and our history? I know it's very uh, meaningful to you. The Moulin Rouge is significant because it stand or stood as, a, as a, um, a way to integrate America during a time when it was segregated. And the fact that it was closed by the um, establishment because it was just not appropriate for blacks and whites to mingle in public, it just wasn't accepted. Not only was it not in, a, in Las Vegas, it, it wasn't accepted across America at the time. Yeah. Now, Anna Bailey was Hello? one of oh, yeah. the lead dancers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the Moulin Rouge's uh, Tropican Can Revue. What brought you to Las Vegas? Well, I was working up in Buffalo, New York, and, um, and Pearl Bailey was on the show, or I was on the show with Pearl Bailey. And um, Keith Kane, if you're going to stay in show business, you have to go to Las Vegas. So it was there that we found out that we were getting ready to go to Las Vegas, and we were booked. And we were ecstatic, we were just so excited. And um, about 20 of us girls came out here and there was all the photographers who were waiting for us at the airport. And we were just thrilled. But the only thing that made us a little nervous, we, we thought we were gonna go to, on the strip. And, and as we, we passed by all the lights and it was getting darker and darker and then we went through the underpass. Uh, we were really <laughs> shocked, but when we saw uh, the Moulin Rouge, it was so beautiful. Mm. And um, and we were just thrilled to be there. Can you describe just the, the look and the feel of Las well, Vegas? Well, I felt like I was in Paris, because mm. they had the gym doms out there with their uniforms on, and, and, um, and, and the dress rooms had, had showers in them, and we had the wardrobe mistresses in them, and it was, it, it was just, a, just beautiful. And just to look out in the, um, the showroom and to see so many people, it was just, 
jam-packed every single night. And I just don't know, I just can't realize to the, to, 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 to the day how the place closed. I just can't understand it. Mm. Tell us about um, opening night at the Moulin oh, Rouge Hotel. Night. What was that everybody like? Everybody was there. Everybody, every, almost all of Hollywood was there. <laughs> almost all the strip was there. All the showgirls from the strip came over, missed that part of their show, the Catch Our Show. It was a uh, hit from the, uh, just from the beginning because um, uh, Clarence Robinson was the choreographer and, the, and, and the, our music was just beautiful. The temperature, temper, tempo was way up like this and, <laughs> and we were just really ha so happy to be here in Vegas and dancing and just to see all the stars out there. I, like Joe Adams, I don't know if you know, everybody might be too young him, but I had a radio show from coast to coast and to see uh, Joe Lewis sitting on the ringside and it was, it was just a fabulous evening. Hmm. I think we have a photo of someone. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it was fun. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Uh, that's when I was young. <laughs> you still look great. Oh, so. bless you, bless you. Honey. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> <laughs> So a uh, frequent visitor of the Harrison House and a uh, legend himself, Sammy Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite photos here, Sammy Davis Jr. dealing 21 at the Moulin Rouge Hotel in 1955. Manny Davis, it is an honor to have you it's with us tonight. It's an honor to be here with everybody on the panel and you, uh, you and everybody in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would like for you just to tell us a little bit about your childhood and what you remember from your time in, in Las Vegas. Okay, well, it's a long story, but I'll make it a little short. Uh, <laughs> I'm adopted to let everyone know, but um, beforehand I was adopted twice. So um, the Davis family has been my third family. Um, my original mother, she had three other children besides me and she was a teenager when it happened. So she couldn't really take care of all of us at one time. So she gave us a up for adoption uh, to this hairdresser from Queens. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it just so happens that um, my mother, um, my father's third wife, Altabies Davis, my future mother, mm -hmm. and her mother, mm -hmm. Altabies also, uh, they, um, they were customers of hers. And I didn't know at the time when I was a kid, but she wanted to have children. And Sammy didn't want to so much. He had three other children, but because of the times, you know, during the 50s and 60s, it was really mm -hmm. hard for him to put his name out there. So he spent most of his time working and wasn't there um, as a family man like they wanted it. Mm -hmm. So he was kind of scared of it. But um, so what my mother did was she just spent more time with me before I got a chance to meet um, my future father. And she fell in love with me. And then it was time to introduce me to Sammy. And so uh, from the first time he met me, he just fell in love. And then I just started touring with him, not like performing on stage yeah. or anything. No, just in the back, I sit down and drink that Roy Rogers. You know, I'll see you in the green room after the show. You know, so um, it was really cool. I got a chance to, um, I call it like a living wax museum, because I got a chance to see all of, the, um, all of the greats back in the days before they got into trouble, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> when they were at their, their highest uh, peak, you know. And so it was a cool thing to see as a kid, all the people you idolized growing up, you get a chance to meet them courtesy of the man they idolized growing up. And so I had that uh, for a good eight years, back and forth between the coasts. And um, I, I equated it to um, um, Annie because when I was in a foster home, I wanted to be adopted by Daddy Warbucks. I wanted to live in the mansion. <laughs> I don't want to live that hard knock life anymore. And it actually happened in real life. Wow. And, but the tragic part is, when it became official in 1989, he passed away five months later, mm. and we lost everything he worked so hard for. It. So oh. it's good to say nowadays, after 30 plus years, I'm now in control of the estate, and we're bringing his legacy oh. back out, just All like right. we're doing with the Harrison right. House in New Love All right. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Who are some of the people you met while, while traveling? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I have a funny Michael Jackson story. Oh. 
Okay, so uh, let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, not not, not that kind of story. <laughs> so, I used to travel with my father there to Atlantic City, Reno, Tahoe, Vegas, all the places in between. Mm-hmm. And um, one time, my father was doing a show, and he started talking about knowing Michael Jackson and when he was a kid, and how much Michael looked up to him and borrowed his records. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't paying attention to Sammy on the stage. I was playing with the cherry and the soda, you know. And so um, all of a sudden, I heard the band play a song I'd never heard before. And I'm like looking up in the air. It sounded kind of strange. And then when I heard Sammy say, yo, bud, it's mine. I'm going to take right now. I'm like, <laughs> that song sounded vaguely familiar. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you got Sammy grabbing his crotch on stage. He's like, I'm bad. Ow, I'm bad. Ow. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Look it up. Trust me. Sammy sings it bad. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> like, one of my favorite idols sing my other favorite idol song. And so um, the show ended, and I just couldn't believe it. And we went backstage to the green room. And my mother always had a way of uh, surprising me. So she opened up the door to the green room, and who was sitting right by the door but Michael Jackson. Oh, my God. Wow. And I was like, ah. <laughs> And so I was shy, so I kind of lifted up my hand like, hi. And he lifted up. The glove with the, uh, with the, the hand with the glove. He was like, hi. <laughs> so that's my Michael Jackson story. <laughs> that's a good story. Thank funny. you. <laughs> so the Moulin Rouge, it opened in the midst of a civil rights battle in Las Vegas. Now, at the time, black residents of the city, they were pushing for a civil rights ordinance that would grant them the right to dine, gamble, and stay at the Strip hotels. Miss Bailey, why was Las Vegas at the time referred to as the Mississippi of the West? Oh, well, that's a long story. It was very hostile when we first came out. Um, you know, we, we couldn't go out on the strip. We couldn't, um, you know, we couldn't go out in some of the restaurants. Like, we couldn't go into the dress shops. So remember, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So to come out here, it was just a culture shock to me. <laughs> you see, um, it was really very, very bad. But, um, but there were some people here that was kind, and they knew that all of this was just way behind time. And that, um, you know, that... Vegas couldn't grow under a situation like this because we all have to be together, to, you know, to, for a town to be successful. And um, so, because sometimes we would go out to the um, to see the other showgirls on on the, on the strip, and they would come over to see us, and then we would get letters and, and, and phone calls that we just can't have that here. Mm-hmm. So I really think that's how we, we got the name of the Mississippi of the West because it was um, very embarrassing to, to me. But we did have a way of walking that they knew we were from the Rouge. And um, <laughs> walking, and, you know, and, and you know, the, the way we were dressed and stuff like that. And so s- sometimes, um, you know, we would go in and, and get our sandwiches, make us go outside with our sandwiches. Mm. But, um, but at least we, we could go in and, and get, you know, and um, it, was, it was really bad. But there were some people that just insist on, like Hank Greenspun from the, the newspaper, from the, the Sun newspaper. And there were some people here that said they would just write up about how bad things were here. And I think that's how things slowly turned and got a little bit better. Right. Mm-hmm. Manny, how did Sammy Davis Jr.'s, um, how did he contribute to the civil rights movement here in Las Vegas? Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, I can. Um, because he, he suffered the same injustices as every other black person did in Las Vegas. Right. And um, a lot of people didn't understand why he still fought so much to be in the other casinos here. And the thing is, he wanted everybody to be all inclusive. Just like how the Moulin Rouge was integrated, he wanted that for the other uh, casinos. And so, you know, it, it broke his heart to always have to um, not be able to mingle with the crowd afterwards or, or at least walk the room. I mean, you just performed in front of all these people. But you now get a chance to say how how how, how you know hi how are you doing or you know hear the accolades that you should get because you know they call him on the stage for encore after encore but then he got ushered out the kitchen like like he was nobody and it's cool that the Harrison House was there it's cool that the Moulin Rouge was there so he could feel like family and all the other entertainers that came after him could feel like family even though he wasn't there so his contribution was to to keep up the fight 
everywhere all across the country, and that's what he was trying to do, just to be an example, you know, that you can do this. Like his book, Yes, I Can, yes. is just his plight to sit there and make, make it so we all can sit in the same room together like we are today. So I really appreciate everything that he did so far. Right. Mm-hmm. And Miss Duncan, as we were just talking about the Harrison House, and we heard about it a little bit in the video as well. Can you talk to us about um, the Harrison House and how you got involved with the property as well? What number is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I got involved with the Harrison House when I was sitting on the City of Las Vegas Arts Commission, actually, and a group came and, and um wanted us to approve the banners that would go on this Pioneer Trail. So later on, uh, when it became available for sale, I was with the Las Vegas, I think we were the Black Historical Society that, at that time. So we decided to acquire the property and, and restore it so that it would be a, a reminder of, uh, of segregation and talk about our history because we were not able to help bring back the Moulin Rouge so we thought we would pick another property and, and work on it and see if we could help with some history, you know, just to preserve our history. Mm-hmm. So that's how I basically got involved in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so where do things stand now at the Harrison House? Well, right now, uh, thanks to the um, Nevada State uh, Commission on Cultural Affairs and the City of Las Vegas, we've been able to completely change out all the sewer lines, the water lines, the electric lines. We put a new roof on the house. And now we were just approached by a major resort and they want to help us out with the garden. So I believe our next step is to build a peace garden to connect with the healing garden. And we wanted to do a, a veterans walk because it was some US military veterans actually who approached us, Stanton Wilkerson and Chris Worth. And they, they knew that Sammy Davis was a veteran, Joe Lewis was a veteran, I think um, Harry Belafonte. These were all US military veterans who were in the entertainment industry, and they had stayed at Harrison House, so we wanted to talk about their accomplishments and, and what they endured and do some type of uh, tribute to them for, for their um, situation in America. And we thought we would start with the Harrison House doing this walk of fame as a way not only to develop Harrison House, but to begin to de- bring about development in, in the entire West Side. Right. Mm-hmm. And- mm-hmm. And I want to talk about the West Side as well. Um, Because, you know, I feel like there's just a lot of hurt there. Um, But a lot of like, a a lot of good and a lot of, a lot of great things to celebrate too. But there is clearly a need to revitalize and to continue to revitalize the West Side community. And I know that a few people on our panel have worked for years to do that. So what kind of steps do you think should be taken to revitalize the West Side community? This is something we've talked about for a while. Absolutely, and um, I believe the first step is having a shared vision. There are some people who believe that progress means just wiping out all of those raggedy old buildings. Why do you want to keep all this stuff? Let's just tear it down and build new. And then there are some people who want to save every little rock. So we have to find a happy medium. Mm -hmm. So we have actually, we're learning about ABCD, asset-based community development. So this is where we would actually use the young people whose future we're actually building for and let them digitize the West Side using all this new techie technology that they have. So we have this 100 plan that the city of Las Vegas helped the community to develop. So we believe the next step is to engage these young people in our Earn to Learn program where they would actually put the whole West Side, the the infrastructure, the the sewer, the water, the waste, the broadband, all of the infrastructure in one digital platform, see what we have there now, and then see what's missing and begin to plan for it. This way we can have the right feasibility so the developers can now come in more easily. Right now it's really difficult for a developer to come into the West Side because they don't know it's so sensitive, they say. So we can actually put on the table and say to developers, this is what we want, and then then we can do an inside-out development instead of so much outside-in. Right. Yeah. Now, as you heard, the Moulin Rouge closed its doors within six months. Miss Bailey, what was your reaction to 
that when you heard that the hotel was closing where you worked? Uh, oh, we were really in shock. I mean, we came to uh, work the next day and the padlocks were on the door. That's mm -hmm. how we found out wow. that the place was closed. But I think that we were taking so much because we did three shows a day. Um, I mean, it's at 8 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, and a 2.30 show. So that means at the 2.30 show, we emptied out the strip, because <laughs> they all came over to catch our show on the west side. And I just think if that had kept on going, I don't know how it would have been built up so much, because they were getting ready to open up the Mardi Gras, uh, which was going to be a, a mall there, and so much um, things were getting ready to, you know, you know building more buildings, and. And it was an exciting time. But I think that, um, I don't know whether we had any mafia here or anything like that. We hear rumors, you know. <laughs> but I think they did a lot to close us up. I really do. That's in my heart. I feel that way, you know. <laughs> because how can you close up with standing room outside all the way around the building every single day? And then when they start leaving the uh, strip and coming over, I think that's what really kind of killed it. And if that had stayed open, because so many, every, every month, I heard that somebody from Australia just bought the site. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that they'll put on something there. And for more development, you know, like, like Catherine was saying, would come over there and, and, and move in and, and build and bring their businesses over there. Because like, um, I, I, you know, we're so close to everything on the west side. Five minutes you can get anywhere on town, to Fremont Street, to the Strip. All the freeways come there. And I think all of that would come back if somebody would just have the faith to, to bring all their businesses over there and, and buy homes and, and, and move over there because it's a lovely community. And I remember it was zoned for horses. Everybody was riding their little horses around, <laughs> you know. And, I, and, it, it was, and my daughter grew up there and she said it was, she had a wonderful childhood, you know. So uh, there's a lot of possibilities that people will just come back, but, but I see where Councilman Cedric Creer, I, I saw in the news today that a lot of development is going into the west side now. So we won't, we'll see a big difference in the next two or three years, I believe. Right. And now after it closed, um, you and your husband, yes. the late Bob Bailey, uh -huh. he, uh, you and him uh, still spent a lot of time on the west side and you really worked hard to revitalize that area. Can yes. you talk a little bit more about that and employ yes, people uh, too? Yes, because uh, Bob was the uh, MC and the production singer in the show. And um, when, when the show cl uh, closed, everybody left town, but we're the only ones that stayed because he saw a potential. In, in, in Las Vegas. And then he loved Las Vegas. He loves the 24 hours where you can go out to White Cross Drugstore 12 o'clock <laughs> at night. You know, I don't know. If, <laughs> and, and he just loved it. He did. You know, and, um, and then the, 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 uh, Governor Soria made him the, the chairman of the Eagles Right Committee. So he used to uh, park his trailer right in front of the hotels. And, um, and it took a lot of nerve for him to do that. And subpoenaed some of the owners there to. Uh, you know, get some work, like not just in, in, in the um, restrooms or something like that, but as cocktail waitresses or... So he, he did a good job at really um, trying to revitalize um, the town at that time. Right. Manny, what, why do you think your father was, was so adored in this community in Las Vegas? Well, he was short and cute. I can, I can <laughs> just say about that. Like. <laughs> but, uh, like, um... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I have too. Yeah, he was. Uh, I, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't know. Like I would say, he loved to entertain since he was a kid. Uh, he started uh, show business at the age of three, and that's all he knew. He never was classically trained in singing, dancing, playing instruments, doing comedy. Uh, all he did was. Uh, stay backstage and watch his father and his uncle perform, and his mother used to also be a vaudevillian. But I think he represented a lot of dreams coming true. Because mm -hmm. the vaudeville ever, when that like, went away, a lot of the artists fell off, because you have to have like, something more, you know? Instead of just dancing and huffing, can you sing, can you act, can you progress, can you do more? And so my father was always in search of learning more, and learning more, and learning more. And there were a lot of people that, you know, he used to let open up for him. 
you know, be the opening act because he liked to foster like education. That's what my mother and father always did. And so everybody loved him so much because he had the gumption to fight for what other people didn't fight for. Mm -hmm. He represented something that uh, normally you wouldn't see outside of, I don't know, your own neighborhood. You know, like he was the only black member of the Rat Pack. And it's messed up nowadays. A lot of people don't even know his name. They oh. can tell you who Frank and Dean are, no, you know, no disrespect to them. But still, his, his legacy needs to be preserved. But they love him so much because he was just so multi-talented mm -hmm. and he can read a room. Just as like, I'm trying to read this room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so serious all of a sudden? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, he, he just knew how to entertain it. And even though he might not get laughs or, or he might get some booze, he still, still, still entertained. He didn't care if it was one person or a thousand people in the room. And I think just over his overall work ethic is what drew people to him. That's why they didn't want him to leave the stage ever. Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you sing or? Dance okay, at all? you know how they sound? They say you sound good in the shower. Uh. <laughs> I need like five going on at the same time. So no, no. <laughs> but I, when I was younger, I did do a little singing, a little okay. dancing. So. <laughs> Which song from your uh, father's repertoire is <clears throat> your favorite? Okay, now this one is kind of self-serving, but it's um, going to build a mountain. Would you like to hear the lyrics? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not gonna sing it. But it's, <laughs> oh. it's uh, going to build a mountain from a little hill, gonna build me a mountain, at least I hope I will. Gonna build a mountain, gonna build it high. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, I only know I'm gonna try. Yeah, yeah. Gonna build me a daydream uh -huh. from a little hope, gonna push that daydream up the mountain slope. Gonna build a daydream, gonna see it through, gonna build a mountain and a daydream, gonna make them both come true. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there's more. <laughs> Going to build a heaven from a little hell. Going to build that heaven, and I know darn well, if I build my mountain with a lot of care, I'll take my daydreams of the mountain, and the heaven will be waiting there. Mm. Now, when I build that heaven, as I will someday, and the Lord sends Gabriel to take me away, I want to find young son to take my place. I'll leave my son on the heaven on earth with the good Lord's grace. Oh, so yeah, it's kind of oh, self-service. Oh, 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 oh. So yeah, you got it, you got so I made a dream come true, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> Preach, <laughs> testify, testify. <laughs> Miss Duncan, um, can you explain what happened after the Moulin Rouge closed? Um, you know, if you hear about it in the news, there's fires and there's these um, new developers that are coming in and you know trying to revitalize it and, and bring it back to life. Um, where do things stand now with the hotel? Well, there is still a lawsuit underway and it seems that the Moulin Rouge has been embattled with lawsuits since the very beginning. But um, to Anna, you thought it suddenly closed because you came to work and it was locked. But there were some people who knew it was going to close. Oh. And so they talk about how they had to carefully sneak the money out because they knew the doors were going to be closed. And um, they, the, the other establishment who wanted to close, they told the vendors that if they sold to the Moulin Rouge, they wouldn't buy from them. So that was yeah. immediately they started those, those activities. But um, right now, today, it's, it's still in a lawsuit, which, which needs to be settled. Um, the person who, who bought it, there's another set of developers who believe they should have had the, the right to buy it. Oh. We even as a community came together to uh, attempt to purchase it ourselves, mm -hmm. and we got a million dollar check bounced to us. I won't even tell you about Ooh. that part. <laughs> when somebody bounces a million dollar check to you, that's pretty good history, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, so, so until that lawsuit is settled, it's probably not a good idea to really discuss uh, what's going on with it, but we would like to see uh, the community be involved in what goes on in the development, no matter who finally gets the right to do it. Because mm -hmm. we believe that um, there needs to be a family, uh, um, and a place where the entire family can go. 
like where grandma can go with, you know, with grandchildren. That's one of the challenges that we're missing in the West Side is, is rec recreation for the entire family. Uh, we need uh, training beyond just um, service training. So to have a, maybe a show business school um, and, and athletics, uh, state, we don't have a stadium in our neighborhood either. And that's one of the pieces of property that's ideal for another major resort. And we're hoping that, that that's what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bailey, what would you like to see uh, in place of the site right now? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'd like to see something something go in there that'll open up right away, right soon, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because it's, it just tears my heart out to see the pictures, because I haven't seen the Moulin Rouge. I haven't been around that area for a while. And to see it, um, you know, in that shape, it's, it looks so bad. I would like to see, naturally, I would love to see the, a club to open up again, yes, because yes, I'd like to yes. see, it would bring more industry over to that area. Mm. and. Um, but there's so many things, that, you know, it's, the location is perfect. So no matter what you put on there, I think it'll be, it'll, it'll work. Mm. And anything that it'll do to lift that side of town up there, because um, it, it, there's nothing over there. I know it's historical west side, but when I go over there, I still don't see anything. But I think it's all in the work. We just have to stay here and, um, and see what will be done. But no matter what they'll put on there, I think it'll be successful. Mm. Because I think right across the street, there's a lot of industry, there's a lot of businesses. So um, I just hope something just happens soon. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What kind of aspirations do you have for the future of the Harrison House? Uh, well, we're so excited that right now, um, it's been a bridge for Eastern Western medicine. We have a free, um, um, Eastern Medicine, Oriental Medicine Clinic every first Friday so we can start to bridge the relations between the African American and the Asian community. Um, we're open for tours every day for people to come in and learn about the history and to talk about the future because I don't, I don't believe that the Moulin Rouge could actually um, be as successful in a vacuum. We need to look at uh, an entire community development and take a really holistic approach to developing the West Side. One of the major barriers is actually transportation, because we've got the big I-15, I-95 mm. freeway that really just blocks it off from the downtown. And I walked from here last week, and it was a 20-minute walk, and I did it in hills. So I think that um, if we can remove some of the uh, physical barriers and, and make it easier for the tourists who are on Fremont Street to get to Jackson Street, I think that'll be a good start. So we really have to look at our infrastructure, especially transportation and broadband, so that we can communicate and um, we can see a big difference in how the entire West Side gets developed. Right. Manny, did your father ever talk about the Moulin Rouge at all? What did you hear about the, the hotel? Uh, actually, n not much. I, I came in at a later time, but mm -hmm. I wasn't around during that time. Uh, but. What I do know about uh, the Harrison House and Moulin Rouge, uh, it was referenced not so, but not by name, but when my father complained about not being able to, you know, hang around the Las Vegas hotels, when he said we had to go downtown, this is where he was talking about, you know, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. where you know he felt safe. And but he, what he wanted to do was open it up for everybody, you know, that was already integrated, you know, that area. But he wanted everybody to enjoy all of his shows. He wanted to enjoy the audience, and so. Right. That's what it was just there for him, and it was a, a very much a convenience because where would he, he where would he stay in his car again in some more when his you know his star was rising higher? Mm -hmm. It was just a, a smack in the face. I felt. So, yeah. And he felt as well. Yeah. Yeah. Before we turn it over to the audience for some questions, I want to give um, <laughs> all the three of you a, a chance to say some final thoughts about the Moulin Rouge. Um, if you have any. First of all, I want to thank you so much for oh. having the heart and the um, willingness to put on such a panel. I know it took a lot of nerves for you to um, bring the mob to the west side and invite us <laughs> in. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Any other thoughts? 
Uh, for me, um, as a person that's trying to preserve a legacy, I think that what everybody here is doing is important, audience included, and preserving a history that should never be lost. Mm. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> well, I love Las Vegas also. Um, I have so many memories with your dad because um, he would come by my house all the time because I always had a pot on the stove, you know. And, um, and sometimes um, uh, he would call me, and, and Kim knows all about it, you know. And I used to make sweet potato pies, and Kim used to take them to Sammy, you know. Oh, really? uh -huh, and, and to Bill Cosby also. Oh. So I have a lot of memories like that. And I like to see those days come back because um, I, I, lo I love entertainers, and I love to entertain, and um, I, I, like to see, I like to see all of that to come back to how, how Vegas used to be. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do want to spend a few minutes to give you all a chance to ask any questions to our wonderful panelists. We do have a mic available, and if you just put your hand up, we can head right over and, and ask any questions. Th I think there's one back there. Yeah. The light's bright, so I can't really see. Uh, uh, up yeah. against the wall, or? Miss Bailey, when you left New York and went to the Moulin Rouge, had you any idea that you were gonna be part of history? And when you figured no, that out. No, I had out, no idea. We're just so glad to, to be there, because I hate to keep dropping Pearl Bailey's name. We're not related or anything, but we <laughs> called each other cuz. And she told us so many years about coming here. And, um, I mean, ask, you, ask, ask me the question again, please. <laughs> no, it's just, it's all right. Please, I don't know, I was I'm just, just so excited you, here, you know. It's okay. I was wondering if you had any idea that you would be part of history. Oh, and then I what had you also... repeat that again. That's what I wanted you to oh, do. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and then... Nice, nice. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> And what had Pearl okay. Bailey told you but, uh, to get I, I, you to I, I, come to Las Vegas? I don't Vegas. think I'm an icon. I, I know my, um, my grandkids call me an icon, but, um, but I'm so glad to, to be here. And I think I'll be here forever. I'll never leave <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We have one right over here. Question for Manny. Yes, sir. Uh, do you live in Vegas now? And if not, how, frequent do you, how frequently do you come back? Okay, I don't live in Vegas, uh, but my wife wants to move here so bad. That's her in the front seat. This is so <laughs> 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 uh, But uh, she loves to gamble so much that we come here about every six weeks to eight weeks. But yes. Wow. Uh. <laughs> she actually got off the plane and played this quarter machine this morning, put $20 in and won $1,000. Got a, a royal flush on the first hit, so All I'm right. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't gamble though, but I just come for the shows. Uh. <laughs> Anna is Woody Woods. Oh, hi, Woody. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm looking at the Moulin Rouge, but I'm thinking about the Baby Grand. Oh, yes, yes. Why don't um, you tell them about, a little bit about the Baby Grand? Oh, yes. And, you know, I opened two or three when the Moulin Rouge closed. And like I said, we stayed. Um, we, my husband and I, we opened up uh, the Baby Grand and, um, Sugar Hill. and Sugar Hill. They're all named after <laughs> clubs in New York. And they were very, very popular, too, because when all the entertainers would come in town, they would come by my place to hang out. So we had, that, that was a, a good time there. And we really, really um, enjoyed being in business here. And, and we went, the, the Baby Grand was on, on uh, Sahara, and the, um, the, the uh, shopping center was on Owens, and then on Miller was the, uh, was Sugar, Sugar, Sugar Hill. Hill, yes. So, um, you know, business was very good for us here. So I, I would encourage everybody to come here and, and um, buy a house <laughs> and, and start a business. Because you know? that's why we're still here, because it's, it's 
fair, it's, it's a good place to, to, to have a business here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Ann Bailey. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Ivy Will. You probably don't remember me. But I performed at the Sugar Hill Club uh, <laughs> with, the, with Terry oh, Quiner and Maceo and all of those good people. Yes. Um, I just want you to let the people know that not only was the Sugar Hill uh, a popular club there, but they had the Colony Club, uh, Love's Cocktail Lounge, uh, Seven Seas. Vegas had many, yes. many, many, many lounges on the west side of Las Vegas. And we had many bands, local bands, like Richard oh. T., um, Stone Gumbo. It was a lot of mm -hmm. entertainment. But what I want to ask you, Miss Bailey, is that can you let them know the, 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 the reason why the entertainers could not live on the strip, but they had to come over to the Cove Hotel, as for instance, to live? Could you explain that to them a little bit more? Well, I know that the Moulin Rouge built a, a houses for us on Berkeley Square. They built three bedroom houses, and that's where we, we stayed, like two girls in each, each uh, room. And, um, and, and like I said, it was, it was, it was, the environment was very, very chilly here. But, um, but I don't know, we just, we're just so happy to be together and, and to be here. And, 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 and like I said, our house was very comfortable and very, very nice. And, I'm sorry, honey? No, no, we didn't get fair housing until 63. So we all had to live on the, uh, on, on the west side. So like I said, it was, um, it hurt you to the heart, you know, to, for something like that to happen. But it made me experience uh, the, the situation here and, and we just went with the flow. But like I said, we, there was a lot of people here that, uh, you know, that was, it was really tried to help us and try to, to make things comfortable for us because they were happy that we were here in town. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, there another but question I, I back here? Oh. Kamisha Monica, everybody, with the Las Vegas Tribune. I'm a partner there, but part of my success comes out of Harrison House. And I just really want to make that like really clear on how imperative that house is for black entertainers you know and i know it's been through a lot because i was over there with miss duncan for about i don't know three to four years and i worked with her trying to get the money in escrow and we were so disappointed when that happened to us so disappointed so, you know, I think this is a wonderful panel into the Las Vegas Review Journal. I can't top this ever, okay? <laughs> but thank you. I just wanted to make that statement so you know that it's real. Right here. Hello, um, my name is Suddenly. I'm a native to Las Vegas, and I've been working with the city of Las Vegas and the city of Henderson for the last six years, and I had a question that I couldn't understand. When I was researching the historic West Side and I got put on the project for city initiatives, I didn't understand when they did allow us to go to the Strip, why did a lot of the small businesses close? Like, can anybody help me understand that? Uh, you, you can answer that one. <laughs> I, I think we all understand your question. <laughs> you know, we're here at the Mob Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> And we don't have our own security with us. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Kim Bailey Turo, uh, publisher of Las Vegas Black Image Magazine. And uh, hey, Ivory. <laughs> I know Mo. <laughs> Mom, Ivory from Maceo, you know. Anyway, oh. okay. Uh, but anyway, why many of the businesses have closed here. See, when the Moulin Rouge opened, it brought a traffic. Even after it closed, we had the Cove Hotel, Ivory, you mentioned that. 
And uh, there was a traffic, there was a flow of people that came from, uh, you know, the Strip, and they patronized the businesses. But I was in business development here in Las Vegas with EOB, with the micro business program over 20 years. And many of our businesses closed because the premiums to have uh, your business insurance is higher in the West Las Vegas. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that still go on to this day that really uh, stuff makes people close up their businesses because what is required versus what's required in other parts of the city. So I just encourage you to uh, ask your public officials what is really going on and <laughs> what is really in place because we do see development in, uh, in the historic west side but the thing is is that these people are coming from other places but we have homegrown businesses, black owned businesses that would like to uh, have their business on the west side but the city, the county all own the land so we have to acquire the land and they you know they don't want to give up the land so really that's the real story <laughs> I saw a hand over here right here we are in the mob museum my my question is you're talking about a time when the mob ran Las Vegas yes. was it the mob that kept blacks off the strip were the mob trying to keep Las Vegas white only? I mean, I, I, I think of Las Vegas back then as being controlled by the mob, whether it was the five families or whatever. And is that what really segregated Las Vegas? I'll take that. So there, were, there, was, um, there was the mob, and then there was a law enforcement, and then there was uh, the churches. And um, the legal businesses had to satisfy their customers. And a lot of their customers had very, very um, unsavory racial thoughts. Un not unlike how it is today, we have some people who are very wicked in our society. And, we, and they've inherited these thoughts from slavery, from their ancestors, and they haven't learned to overcome them. And it's not something that we're not dealing with today. I mean, look at the newspapers, watch television. The racial climate in America really needs to heal. I think you can all agree. Yeah. I do want to give the mic to um, Ms. Chris Hartfield. Um, to talk about the estate plans. I know that there was a question about the, the future of uh, the Sammy Davis Jr. estate. Okay. Uh -huh. um, hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Hartsville, and I am the executive manager of the estate of Sammy Davis Jr. Um, a couple things that we have kind of coming up. Uh, this year is the first time in 32 years that we're opening up his gravesite to have fans visit and pay respects. So that's something to look out for this December, uh, December 8th of this year. Wow. Um, we have a biopic in the works, first one ever. Um, there's been a lot of documentaries out there, but this is gonna be the first official estate sanctioned biopic. So if you guys aren't already following our social medias, we're uh, official Sammy Davis Jr. on Instagram and on Facebook, we're Sammy Davis Jr. Um, and yeah, we're rec recreating some of the music. And so we're just trying to get this new generation to know who he is. A lot of them know some about the Rat Pack, but not really. And so we're trying to just make sure that that history stays alive, that legacy it lives forever. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing right now. But stay tuned. We have a lot more coming up. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we are right on time, which is rare. So I'm just going to keep this show rolling. Do we have our performers in the, the audience? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So are y'all ready to party? <laughs> um, I, I want to give a special thank you again to our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, okay. Are we ready to party tonight? Wait, wait, wait a minute now. No, no. I need to hear you. Are we ready to party tonight? 
Are we going to do Vegas tonight? We're going to do Vegas like Vegas has never been done before. So let me hear it. Come on. Come on. All right. Now, let me start off. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. All you beautiful, beautiful people out here this evening. Now, welcome to a night at the Moulin Rouge celebrating the iconic Las Vegas Resort featuring an extraordinary lineup of music and dance for your entertainment. All right? Did you hear me? For your entertainment. Now, I am delighted and I'm in an honor to be your master of ceremony for this particular extraordinary event. First, my name is Alan Craig Harris. I am an actor, director, and a producer from the city that never sleeps, the Big Apple, New York City. All right? Now, I just want to change a saying that I've been hearing all of my life, that what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. But listen to this. Wait. Wait a minute. Now, let this event tonight at the Mob Museum be the first to say what happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas because this event of extraordinary talents that you're going to hear tonight is definitely something that you all will enjoy, remember, and share. Did you hear me? You're going to be on the phone tonight. You're going to be emailing tonight. You're going to, I, I swear, I'm not lying. You're going to be out there tonight talking about this particular event. So I want you just to sit back, relax, and enjoy what we're going to bring to you tonight. But now, I want to set the evening up with a specific period of time. From its opening night on May 24th, 1955, the Moulin Rouge attracted a mixed clientele of black and white patrons. Okay? Celebrities such as Bob Hope, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, Henry Belafonte, Dean Martin, Milton Barr, Judy Garland, Marlene Dietra. Now, check this out. The black performers who performed and graced the showroom that night. Listen to these characters now. Just listen. Lionel Hampton. Diana Washington. Gregory Himes. And the Platters. But more importantly, the Moulin Rouge gave opportunities to black people on the west side. They worked as dealers cocktail waitresses, security guards, managers, just to say a few. So now, ladies and gentlemen, keep that in mind, and I want to keep that particular era in our mindset tonight when we start. But first, before I call up the first performer, we're going to hear from our band, Woody Woods and the trio. Check it out.
That's Woody Woods, Woody Woods, and the trio, ladies and gentlemen, give them another round of applause. Come on. Didn't I tell you we're going to turn the house out tonight? What goes on tonight in Vegas will be remembered for a long, long time. I'm telling you, we're going to turn it out tonight because we have a show that will not wait. Okay? I'm telling you, it is going to be phenomenal. So, now, let's move on. The history, grace, style, and skill that this one person possesses can easily fill a stage and in any room. He began his tap dancing career at the age of 13, okay? And <laughs> he danced on a bar that was called Louisiana Pub right here in Las Vegas. And that was more than 50 years ago. 50 years ago, Stick. Keep it in mind now, because when you see this guy dancing. Oh, uh, at the age of 14, check this out, he performed with Maceo Anderson groups. All right, they in the house, they in the house. The Four Steps and A Miss, and later, the Third Generation Steps for more than 10 years. They performed, check this out, with Jerry Lewis, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Diana Shore, Pearl Bailey, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., just, just to name a few, okay? With such a monumental performance at the Cotton Club in New York, of course. <laughs> That's where I'm from. Uh, <laughs> and he performed um, with the uh, winning Black and Blue in Paris and also on Broadway. Now, this performer, ladies and gentlemen, can do it all. When I say all, he can sing, he can dance, and he can act. You haven't seen anything yet, ladies and gentlemen, until I introduce this gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage over there, Mr. Ivory Wheeler. Come on, guys, give it up. Give it up for Mr. Ivory Wheeler. Do it, baby. Turn it out. First of all, before I even start doing anything, I want to say how good it feels to be back home. And to be here with, with some of the people that have watched me grow up from Mason's dance studio from 600 Line Club, which was at his house in the basement. They watched, uh, they watched us to grow and develop, you know, here in Las Vegas. Uh, Miss Bailey and her daughter, you know, she uh, can't even took tap classes from <laughs> years ago. And that's not telling our age, that's telling how seasoned we are. <laughs> but before, before I hear this music, I want to do something that I call the Vegas. <laughs> it's called the Vegas Gamble Around.
I got a weak finish. I got to do it again. What was that? Oh. and gentlemen. Come on, you can do better than that. Give it up. Give it up for Mr. Avery Wheeler. All right. But check this out. We will bring Mr. Avery Wheeler back in a few minutes, okay? I, 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 look, did not, tell, did not promise you, first of all, did not promise you that you're going to have a, a great time tonight. We are going to turn Vegas out tonight. So get on the phones, text, do whatever you got to do, call your friends and tell them 
that whatever stays in Vegas is not going to stay here tonight. You're going to tell your friends. You're going to share this. You're going to share this event. Now, can I just see some hands of out-of-state people? Who's from out-of-state? Oh, good God. All these beautiful people from out-of-state. Uh, just quickly, Chicago, New York. All right, New York. Um, L.A.? New Orleans, Carolina. Oh, I'm loving this. I am loving this because we have a melting pot in here tonight. This is beautiful. This is so beautiful. And I am just so proud of all of you who have taken the time to fly in to Vegas to, to check that out, the turbulence, to see us. <laughs> okay? Um, I have a little game that I'm going to play after our next performance. It's not a game, it's just a, a, a quiz. I just want to find out how many people who is in, 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 in form and also understand some of the great events that happened here in um, 1955. Uh, as I said early on, we we're setting the mode tonight for 1955. Do you feel it? Do, do, I mean, can, can, can you just feel, I don't know, we're not that age, but can you feel what happened in Moulin Rouge uh, when they opened? This is, this is what happened. This is the type of event, this is the type of evening that everyone who came there experienced. So it's phenomenal, is it not? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Our next performer, um, she has performed on stage with some of the world's most celebrated people. Did you hear what I said? Celebrated. All right. So now let me just name them carefully. Michael Bolton, Herbie Hancock, Stevie Wonder, Ronnie Laws. Okay. Her beautiful, sultry voice will leave a memorable and pleasant impression on all of you sitting out here tonight. Did you hear me? You are definitely going to feel her. And she is going to grace this stage so beautifully. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the one, the only Paris Red. <laughs> Now, for me, <laughs> for me, Duke Ellington is why I got to Vegas. It's a long story, I ain't going to say it. But his music was so indicative of the soul of our nature. And this is one of the tunes dedicated to him. Oh, 
gentlemen, this Paris Red. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she lovely? Now just let me let you know, she has three bodyguards outside waiting for her. So be careful. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Miss Red. Ah, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Are you guys having a good time? No, no, come on. Are, are, are you having a good time? That's all I wanted to hear. Did I promise you a good evening? Are you enjoying this good evening? What goes on in Vegas tonight does not stay in Vegas. Get on the phone and call some folks, okay? <laughs> all right. Just before we bring up Mr. Ari uh, Wheeler once again, I just want to ask a couple of questions and just see where you are in the audience. Um, my question is name three great events that occurred in 1955 in Las Vegas. Anyone in the room? Anyone in the room? And I repeat the question. Name three great events that occurred in 1955 right here in Las Vegas. Let me see some hands. The opening of Berkeley Square. Okay. What, oh. what, what the, did she say? The opening of the Moulin Rouge, the opening of Berkeley I love Square. You. That's and number the, one. And the, oh, 
And give the, me another one, somebody. You can give me oh, another one if you like. Opening a Berkeley Square. The first black dentist arrives. Okay, well, I didn't have that one written down, but hey, hey, I love it. I did not write that one down, but thank you. So I'm, it's actually four. I need, I need one more. I need actually two more if you can give it to me. Can somebody give me another one? That's two already. <laughs> no, we're not going to go with that. <laughs> give, me, <laughs> give me another one. Somebody, please. The, the first black newspaper yeah. in 1955? Yeah. Dear God, I mean, I didn't, I didn't even know this. <laughs> wow. Now, you, you, do you mind if I give you one of them that I'm thinking of? <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, Las Vegas celebrated its 50th birthday on May 23rd, 1955. Did you know that? Ah, ah, <laughs> okay, uh, one more, and then we will go on with the next performer. One more? Yes, T talk to me. What? I didn't hear you. Don't be shy, please, come on. This, we, we, we're just enjoying ourselves tonight. No, I just said I'm ready for one more. <laughs> what? Okay, you want the answer? Okay, the nine-story tall building of the Riviera building was opened on April 20th, 1955. Okay, so there we go. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. Um, I'm so excited. I'm just, in, I'm enjoying myself. I really am. And this band, aren't they great? I mean, God, they, they, they are phenomenal. They really are. So we're going to bring back this phenomenal tap dancer, and he's going to give you another show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the stage, Mr. Ivory Wheeler. Thank you. Some history about my art form, the dance, tap. A lot of people think that it was done out of necessity, the smile. Gregory used to do too to much smile, and he was sitting beyond. And if you notice myself, either late or late. Um, this dance came as a part of the underground movement, as a part of communication. As a party, as a part of letting people know that master is coming, is coming through the door, and for you to look out. So, so we had many different, they had different sound, different movements, and different steps that they would do. I'm not going to do any of those. But I just wanted to, just to give you a slight history of why this dance is so important to me. This dance opened up doors for me. His dance kept me from going insane. His dance kept me from gangbanging and robbing me. Okay? This dance does for me what basketball did for Michael Jordan or Kobe Brown. That's what this dance does. Okay? And I want to close it out with a little soft shoe. So can we do $7? What do you think? What do you think about it? Should we do $7 should I just do this me for the end? What do you think?
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Avery, the legendary, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Avery Wheeler, legendary. Please give him a round of applause. Oh, my God. Now, see if we were all back in 1955, this is what was happening at. <laughs> you see what we were missing in Moulin Rouge? Yes, I tell you, it was th those days. I really wish that I could have experienced it, but just from reading it and thinking about it, it's, it was just moving to see those entertainers, how they performed and made such an impact in our lives. And when they were graced uh, the opening night with um, a melting pot of different talents, white and black, it changed the world. It changed the world to where we are right now. So it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful evening to be here and experience this historical moment of listening to music that really took place and to also talk about the events that happened before my time. But look where we are today. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to have one more selection before I call up my last performer. Ladies and gentlemen, coming back to the stage is Paris Red. I didn't get a chance to sing out loud, so I'm going to do it now. It's for the way you look at me. And oh, it's for the only one that I see. I mean, and gentlemen again isn't she lovely now ladies and gentlemen we're down now to our last performer I tell you I have had a wonderful time just being your master of ceremony this evening oh boy brings back a lot of memories listening to some of the songs absolutely um, this is what it's all about what you see tonight what you're experiencing tonight, this is what it's all about. Getting together, going out and enjoying an evening of entertainment with these beautiful talents. 
So ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, when watching our next performer, one cannot help but get involved in the magic, the magic of his performance. He sings as if the story was just unfolding right in front of your eyes. And I'm being very serious about that. His performance will bring you nothing less than sheer enjoyment, nostalgic adventure, and the time of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me an honor and a pleasure to bring this gentleman to the stage, Mr. Leon Gilliman. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Leon Gilliman. Take the stage, my friend. Yeah, I'm going to tell you where this job came from. Besides my mama. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I, just, I was going to do this, and I'll, but uh, some things changed. But ladies and gentlemen, this is from a gentleman that you all know who's a classic, smooth, smooth singer. I love, appreciate it. And my friend, ladies and gentlemen, this is the original jacket from Mr. Joe Williams. Oh. <laughs> he used to tell me all the time, Leon, I can hear you sing all the time. I'm going like, who are you talking to? <laughs> this man was fabulous and he was, was a very good friend of mine. I loved him, I cherished him, and I appreciate him for everything. Because when he passed away, I got a call from his wife, Joe, and she says, Leon, Joe loved you, and everything that you can wear is yours. Mm. Oh. And I cried like a baby. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, this is the wisdom from Mr. Joe Williams. Wounded heart 
will he Never much to do. Two people I want to say 
thank you, thank you so much to, to my cousin, Vanessa and Rick. They've been here, we've been traveling all over the world. This is their first time having an opportunity to really see me sing on stage. So I have to say thank you. They moved to Arizona, so we did. So I'm gonna pull it here. I keep pointing this young lady over here because I call her my little sister. Uh-oh. Yes, baby. She's sitting over here like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever want anything, some sweets, you know, we all like sugar, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah, we like sugar. sugar. Uh, <laughs> she is the owner of one of the fabulous great stores been in this city for years called Castle of Cakes. Oh. It's Castle of Cakes. Wait a minute. Day. You know about it. Yes. <laughs> Custom cakes. Cupcakes. I know, do y'all know anything about cake pops? You do know? Because to me, it's like the young folks. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, so y'all know about that, so we can have all those available. And we do anything else, but that's my little sister. And this next song I want to dedicate to Miss Janice. That's my sweetheart here. She is one of the uh, ladies from one of the facilities I do. So uh, I'm, this is the time, if you feel like enough dancing, don't be shy. Janice grabbed that husband over there. Ladies and gentlemen, for my years, the second generation of that group that started, the originals at the age of 15, from the platters, only you. Come to my 
Well, once again, give Mr. Leon another round of applause. And we promised, I promised you that it was going to be a fabulous evening. It was a great evening, right? Now I'll turn it over to this lovely. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all for being here tonight at the Mob Museum. What a beautiful night to really share with all of you. A big round of applause for our band and a big round of applause for the man who brought us through the night, Mr. Alan Craig Harris. <laughs> Have a wonderful night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> 